This episode of The Meat House is brought to you by Amoretti, the ultimate manufacturer of brewers' natural infusions, craft purees, and concentrates to bring your next batch to the next level. Click on the link in the episode description below to see their full lineup of flavors. Use promo code MEATHOUSE at checkout to save 15% off your next order. Well, good evening, and uh, welcome to the Mead House. Tuesday night here again, we've got uh, Jeff and Aaron, Mississippi Chris along with us here tonight. Lucky to have him. Apparently, it's been quite busy down there uh, in his neck of the woods, but I understand, Chris, you got the pager right, sitting right next to you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, if we, uh, if the pager, if we happen to hear the pager going off in the background, uh, and we don't hear any more out of Chris, and uh, we'll know what happened. But uh, like I said, welcome to the Mead House. This is a show all about making mead. Uh, just four guys sitting around a table yakking about uh, mead making, our experiences, uh, and uh, recipes. We uh, do have a website, themeadhouse.com. Uh, you can go there and listen to the show. You can also get to our Facebook from there, The Mead House. Uh, we don't do the Twitter thing, sorry. We do have a call-in number if you happen to be listening live. That's 818-921-4680. 818-921-4680. Heck, if you want to, put us on your speed dial. Um, and uh, like I said, I think I introduced everybody. Uh, Aaron Martin in the house, Mississippi Chris Spencer. Uh, Jeff Schaus, and of course they call me J.D. Webb. I guess I was born with that name too, but what the heck. So uh, we always like to start out the show with a couple of shout-outs, guys, and I picked up a couple today, one from John Talkington from the Mead Makers group uh, Facebook deal. Uh, and if you if you don't belong to that group, you got to get over and check this out. He says he made a five-gallon batch of mead, uh, and uh, with and, and there's a picture of blueberries actually, but uh, and uh, Jeff, this might be something up your alley. It's a, uh, I, I think it's a, uh, what do they call it when uh, they use hops and whatnot? Uh, braggot? Well, you you could call it a braggot, although I believe the braggot is more from fermentable sugars from malt. I think if you're just making a hopped mead. That technically falls in the methylene category. Yeah. Well, he uh, he apparently used blackberries and ale yeast. Didn't boil anything. He's going to use the Bavarian mandarina hops instead of cascades. This is apparently from a recipe that he's following circa 1980. Uh, but it sounds like it's going to make a pretty nice little session mead, uh, so he says. So... I want to keep up with John uh, on that and to find out how that works out for him. Matt Williams, uh, Mead Brewers and Enthusiasts uh, Facebook group. Uh, he's got a Boche experiment going, nine hours on low in the crock pot. Uh, he says he overslept. <laughs> That's why the nine hours. <laughs> Hey, what the heck? And now here's something rather unique. I mean, you know, we're all about DIY here on the show. Uh, and uh, Aaron, he put a liner, some kind of a plastic liner in his crock pot. He left one corner of the bottom sticking up out uh, of the heat, I, I guess. And so when it was all done, he could pick the whole thing up and snip the corner like a piping bag and let the honey pour out into whatever vessel that he was using. I thought that was a pretty unique uh, idea. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. I Having just um, caramelized some, some honey myself in the crock pot, trying to pour that through my funnel into my, you know, my primary fermenter, which, which I'm still using glass carboys for, that was no easy task. I definitely, I think I lost some to just splashing and, and falling out the, the edges there. So it sounds like a, a pretty neat idea to me. Yeah. And uh, so, Matt, uh, good luck with that uh, project you got going there. Like the DIY uh, 
uh, with I haven't tried doing uh, honey in a crock pot yet, but uh, I have boiled in a pan uh, that didn't go the right way. So I've done it in the uh, pressure cooker. So I guess I suppose I should probably try the crock pot method next. Um, what are we drinking tonight, uh, Jeff? What do you got in your cup, bud? Oh, I've got another uh, another nice bottle of this English IPA that I made for Fourth of July. Um, so yeah, just trying to drink up some of my stock here. Yeah, that's uh, you know I probably need to get with you sometime and, and talk beer for a little while. I'm just getting started in my beer making, and uh, you know we talked about last week on the show that we thought maybe we should branch out just a little bit, get into beer making. I like the idea of honey and hops and, and all of that, the, the braggot thing. So we might branch out a little bit and uh, have some discussions on that. Aaron, what's in the uh, glass? So tonight I'm drinking, it's called a Tuco-style freakout. This is a agave lime mead from Bee Nectar. Uh, for those in the audience that are Breaking Bad fans, this is named after the, what is it, Tuco Solomon from, from that show, and um, it's it's pretty nice, actually. I I find it to be kind of a lighter bodied session strength mead that actually the the lime flavor gives it a nice level of like residual sweetness almost. It's kind of like a sweet lime flavor. Uh, it's really refreshing. As okay. we were discussing yeah earlier before the show, it's been so daggum hot everywhere. <laughs> this is definitely refreshing on a, a hot day. Yeah, I'll bet. And uh, Mississippi, I, I know it's going to be probably a Starbucks uh, in the hand with the pager sitting next to you there, but what you got, bud? Well, I'm running a little bit late, so I'm just now getting around to uh, dinner, or as we say, supper. So, okay. <laughs> so I've got a, I've got a uh, sirloin steak, uh, potatoes au gratin, and a nice big uh, mason jar full of good old southern tea. Well, uh, wow, that sounds uh, that sounds pretty darn good all on itself. Um, I'm drinking I'm drinking a beer tonight, and I, and I came across this beer. We had it at a local restaurant. It's a uh, it's a craft beer put out by Golden Road, a California craft brewery down here, and it's called Get Up Off of That Brown. Uh, it's made in Los Angeles uh, here. And it's one of the few porter style uh, ales that I, I kind of like. It's got a nice little, very slight little coffee. You can tell I'm still after that coffee thing, but uh, anything with coffee in it, I seem to enjoy. But uh, this, I just I couldn't I couldn't put it down, and found myself going back to the store to get a couple of more six packs just to you know keep them on stock. So beer night for me here tonight. So, uh, again, welcome, everybody, to the Mead House. Uh, you know, last week, I, some, I, I, whether it was me, this damn it computer, or, or whatever the hell happened, uh, I dropped the front part of the show. We didn't miss much, about the first 10, 15 minutes, I guess. We were, we were talking coffee, and I kind of wanted to uh, do a redo, and... Uh, you know, spend a little bit more time uh, talking about that uh, for the folks who missed it, uh, who weren't tuned in live. So sorry, uh, Scott, I know you're probably listening, but you're going to hear all this a second time around. But I think I started off, guys, by talking about the two coffee experiments that I chucked down a drain. It just was not working out. Uh, the coffee... Uh, wasn't coming together, and I pretty much resigned myself to the fact that although I don't like a whole lot of sweet things, and that includes cake, candy, ice creams, none of that, um, and I'm the same way with my beverages. I don't drink sweet tea. I don't like lemonades and, and Kool-Aids, that kind of thing. Um, so... <sighs> You know, um, I guess maybe you just got to go the sweet route with this coffee thing to make it all work. Um, you know, so the, the two I had going, they, you know, and I'm not a 
fan of back sweetening. I don't know how you guys uh, feel about that, but it just wasn't coming together. So, uh, Jeff, what's your thoughts on on this whole coffee thing uh, from your perspective? Well, let's uh, let's let's be honest. Uh, coffee is always going to have a level of residual bitterness. Um, part of that is the astringency of the bean. Part of that is just uh, the other bitter flavors that are associated with the roast of the bean. Um, and you got to balance those. And when it comes to ma- to mead, um, you want a pleasant level of balance between a little bit of sourness, a little bit of bitterness, or a little bit of astringency, and the sweetness. Um, they don't have to be exactly in tandem, but they 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 really ought to be close. Yeah. Um, so I think I think you're right on the money that you know with the coffee you're going to get some acid, you're going to get some bitterness, and you need the sweetness to be up there. Um, in order to, to balance the two. Um, if you had a particularly like really light roast that was low in the acid and low in the bitterness, um, you could probably get away with a trier mead to, yeah. to complement it. But I think the overall the sweet is the way to go. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it, it comes down to, you know, I guess if you want to go to the dry side, it just comes down to the selection of the bean and uh, I mean, of course, there's a whole process involved in in, in putting all that together. We were doing a, a cold brew, uh, and it's difficult. Uh, it's difficult to really gauge how much coffee you're going to wind up getting. Aaron, you were you and Jeff were doing a Boche style coffee. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, how's that working out for you? I think it turned out pretty well. So actually, it was not this past weekend, but the weekend before that, I racked the coffee boche mead from primary to secondary. And, uh, you know, anytime you get in there racking, it's always a good opportunity to have a sample and and taste it. And uh, I have to say, I was very pleasantly surprised by it. Um, Now, I, I will also state that we did not caramelize all of the honey that we used in this recipe. Um, I'd have to go back and check the notes, but I want to say it was maybe about a third of the honey was caramelized and then the remainder to bring it up to a a starting gravity of 1.130 was just raw honey. So couple the the caramelized honey flavor with the the coffee that I used, which was a lighter roast, a, a Guatemalan roast, uh, Guatemalan bean, um, it definitely had kind of a, a delicate coffee flavor. And with that, you know, 1.130 starting gravity, it, it definitely left a decent amount of residual sweetness. Um, I would say with this batch, I would consider lowering the starting gravity because it is a little bit on the sweet side um, and, and maybe a little bit less sweetness would be good. Or try to increase the amount of coffee or the way that we introduce the coffee to the mead. Um, and JD, I think that was one of the things that, that we may have lost in last week's episode was some further discussion about instead of just cold brewing coffee and adding that to the primary, actually soaking those beans in the mead. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, you know, uh, I had a conversation with Chris. I think I had discovered something. And this goes back to um, Patty Mackey, uh, who was on the show here a few weeks back. And, uh, you know, she had cold-soaked her mead, uh, traditional mead, uh, on some beans. And, uh, Chris, uh, you and I had a discussion about that a couple of weeks ago. And I think I emailed you or texted you that uh, uh, I told you that I think I found the answer. Uh, yeah, you said you said it really turned out. Uh, just excellent but then later on you said you were kind of disappointed or something and i i I don't know if that was because of your uh base need that you thought needed to be a little bit different or or what that was yeah i had taken a vanilla mead that it it was already done uh and uh, you know making a vanilla mead out of it and i thought well vanilla and coffee beans go together I put a little bit together, and it tasted wonderful. But then when I put the whole batch together, eh, it kind of went down a different road. It's still not bad. 
it's not a hundred percent, but it's 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 by far so much better than any of the coffees. And I've already done four or five of them. You know, the, the experiments already. Uh, by far, it's it's the best. And I I really think um, I really think Patty Mackey has something because here's the deal, guys. Uh, you know, uh, you gather up your beans, you put them in your secondary, and you treat it like you would oak. Uh, you know, that uh, the additional flavor that you're looking for, or vanilla beans, or, you know, something that's going to give you a little bit more mouthfeel. Uh, because you can pull them out uh, when you get to a point where you think you've got the flavor, you know, profile that you're looking for. And I just think that that's the best way to go. Well, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. Uh, I've mentioned before that when I started this this whole coffee thing with you guys, I was going to do something on the side. Um, yeah. And I did one that was sort of a variation where I, I put some hot water in for like 30 seconds and then cold brewed it with cold water from there on just to bloom the grounds. That was, yeah, well, it really wasn't all that different than the first one that J.D. and I did, uh, strictly cold brewing. Uh, I couldn't really tell a difference. But, you know, I always like to satisfy my own curiosity about these things. So I got a third batch going, and it is by far the best one. It's the closest thing to what I was expecting to get in the first place. Yeah. And I did everything that you shouldn't have done. I did everything that everybody said don't do. <laughs> um, I love uh, So basically, uh, I brewed up uh, a gallon of coffee, uh, just like you would brew it in the coffee maker with hot water, uh, more near boiling, just off boil. Yeah. Brewed up a gallon of coffee. And that was what I mixed with honey. And I finished it out at, um, I think it came out, they quit about 10.26, 10.24, 10.26, somewhere around in there. By far the best one of all three. Uh, it, it is not something that I would still, I don't, I don't think I would go to the store and buy it. Yeah. But, um, but it's very I mean, it's not bad. Yeah. It's not bad. Uh, you guys are going to get a bottle of it when it's, uh, when we finally get around to, to doing a trade with some of this stuff. So you can give me your opinion. But to my taste, uh, it's, it's really close to what I was looking for. Yeah. And I basically just broke all the rules that everybody said not to do. So. Well, there you go. And I, I did it in secret so that if it was a disaster, I could, you know, nobody would ever know I ever did it. <laughs> Just keep it, it. keep it to yourself, then. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's funny. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, and, and I'm still going to pursue this coffee thing. I mean, I'm not done yet, but not by a long shot. Um, I mean, I love coffee, and I love anything with coffee in it. So. Uh, you know, me being a more of a lager type, uh, beer drinker, my wife is the ale drinker in the house, the darker, you know, stouts and porters. Uh, this one that I'm drinking tonight has, a, you know, that coffee flavor to it and I love it. So, uh, I'm still going to pursue this coffee thing now. Uh, and I just might give Chris's method a try. I mean, what the heck, you know? Uh, you know, Dude, I just bought a, I bought a, a bag of, <clears throat> I forgot how many, two or three 12 ounce bags of Starbucks French roast already ground, uh, from Walmart. I'm talking, you know, like seven bucks a bag. Anybody can get it. Yeah. Uh, dark roast, brewed up a gallon. That's all. That's it. No, all, all three bags. I can't remember. I mean, I made it uh, whatever it took to make a gallon. I can't remember. I mean, I buy the stuff anyway, so yeah. Um, I just uh, I, I made it up regular strength, just like I would would drink it if I was making a cup of coffee. 
Okay. And that, that replaced the water in the recipe. And, uh, yep, nothing to it. Simple, easy, and uh, not my favorite meat in the world, but it's uh, it's much closer what to what I take- had. Uh, what 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 do you need to do? Do you think to to make it the better mead in the world? I mean, what 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 direction do you need to go with it? Do you think? Well, I think to my my palate, mead and coffee are not the best combination. Okay. So I don't think there's anything really to do. Uh, I, I guess I'm just not a. Turns out I'm not a fan of coffee mead. I thought I would be. Yeah. Uh, but there's some there's some conflicting flavors there to my taste that I really just don't. Uh, it's just not my favorite, and oh. I don't think there's any way to make it my favorite. It, but it's a good meat. It, it's good for for the style. It's good for what it's supposed to be. And you can bet I'm going to drink it, uh, and I'm going to drink it. You know, and I may make it again. Yeah. Uh, but it's not going to be. Uh, it's not going to turn into a 15 gallon batch or anything. Yeah, you know, and that, that might be my trouble too. Uh, you know, I just, I just might not be, uh, you know, uh, a, a mead coffee drinker either. I mean, you know, I take one or the other. But uh, mm-hmm. Jeff, Aaron, how do you, what do you guys think? Well, as far as my batch went, um, I, I kind of need to to uh, corroborate with Aaron there. I mean, the uh, I feel like it finished a little bit sweet. Um, to my palate, really, it didn't have the coffee flavor that I was going for. So I think I'm going to finish it with because I I felt like we brewed a little bit weak. I think I used something like eight ounces of uh, coffee in my cold brew. Um, I think I'm going to let it sit on another eight ounces uh, for a day or so and see if I can cold brew out some into the mead and give it a little bit more coffee character that way. Yeah. Uh, I like the way I like the way the coffee flavor and the roast flavor of the little bit of uh, honey we used came through. Um, honestly, I think if I were going to do this again, I would go full tilt and just caramelize all the honey um, because the, the coffee flavor can take it, especially with the intensity of coffee flavor that I want. Um, so you're looking for something more along the lines of a Kahlua type. Uh Flavor, something that's very, very rich in coffee flavor, a little on the sweet side, still has I'll, that little bit of bitterness. I think that's probably what I'm after, too, to be honest with you. Yeah, I, you know, I'll take the sweet if I have to, but uh, what I'm really going for is that strong coffee flavor. Um, and it, it sounds like that's, that's going to be what it needs for balance. Uh, now, I, I will mention I have had a coffee mead that I really enjoyed at one point or another. Um, it was was not exactly only coffee. If I remember right, it was coffee and blackberries. Um, but it was a, a, a professional meadery out of Baltimore, if I remember right. Uh, but somebody brought in a bottle of this stuff at my, my mead tasting exam just for you know, here's some weird stuff we can we can show you guys to try now that you've passed the exam. Um, and it was delicious. It, it, they called it a breakfast mead because it was the, the blackberries and the coffee together. Sure. And you would not expect those two flavors to go well together, but they really did. They complemented each other really nicely. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, what, what gravity did you guys end up on your coffee? I'd have to double check my notes. I want to say mine finished at about one point oh two four ish. Yeah, I, I want to say mine was in the one point oh twos as well. Um, I I don't have my notes in front of me right now. Well, that's about right. With a with a starting gravity of eleven thirty, you should be about ten twenty six, ten twenty four, somewhere in there. Yeah, I think that's where I finished. I'll double check, but pretty sure that's where I wound up at. Well, I'd like to get Patty Mackey back uh, on the line with us. Uh, maybe I can contact her in a future show and uh, and really ask her. I want to ask her some more questions about the method that she used. 
she does the uh, you know the, you know she completes her mead and then uh, you know puts the beans in secondary and basically cold brews her mead. Um, and I think uh, you know if you do it that way, you can you can really have almost absolute control over the amount of coffee flavor. Uh, you know, just leave it in there for a few hours and get uh, get a slight coffee flavor, or you know, heck, you can leave it in there for a week, and uh, you know, and even add more if you have to to get a more richer, fuller coffee flavor. So, um, we're not done with this yet, and uh, I, you know, I, I've, I I definitely have some more experimenting to do. Um, I still think that there's a way. Uh, and it may be that I come up with something like Patty Mackey has done. Now she, I remember distinctly that she said that uh, her mead, her coffee mead, was along the lines of a good, better than Kahlua. In fact, I think she said. <laughs> so <laughs> that's I'm looking for that. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for that. Um, but anyway, enough on the coffee uh, thing. Um, uh, and just to, uh, just to spend a minute here, Chris, uh, a while back, he had sent me some sourwood honey and, uh, I ran into, we, we started off, uh, made a three gallon batch, started off at, uh, 1132, I believe it was. And, uh, it went to, uh, zero five zero and, and, or no, what was it, Chris? 44, I think. And it just yeah, quit. Yeah. yeah. We it, thought you were cool. it, it just quit. And I, I did everything. I mean, I did. I made, I made starters. I warmed it up. You know, I, I added some some uh, some little bit of DAP and some nutrients. I mean, I, I did the whole thing. And I was all over, you know, every freaking forum out there looking for ideas and talking to Chris and whatnot. And I got disgusted with it. And uh, so I covered it up, stuck it in a corner, and I was kidding with Chris today. I just, you know, I texted him. I said, dude, you're not going to believe this. But uh, it's down to like 026. And I thought, what in God's name? And, of course, Chris, uh, you know, I, I told him, I said, don't ask me what I did. And then, of course, he does. And I said, well, I, I cussed at it every day. I cussed at it. <laughs> so, it, yeah, and we did. And, you know, we covered all the bases. And, yeah. and by the time we got finished analyzing this thing as to why it had stalled and we couldn't get it restarted, uh, you know, it's one of those things where it makes you ask yourself, should I really be doing a podcast telling other people <laughs> what to do when we can't restart this simple, <laughs> this simple traditional <laughs> need? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we literally did. Everything we covered yep. all the bases. Yep, pH. Uh, there. Yep, temperature. I mean, I mean everything. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, I've got rock solid temperature control, both heating and cooling. My fermenters have a have an electric blanket type. Uh, you get it at the brew shops, but it's like an electric blanket thing that you can wrap around it goes underneath the the neoprene insulation that goes around the fermenter itself i'm within a degree okay one way or another on temperature so i can take it up i can take it down i mean everything was right on the money right on the money and uh, it just quit and so we covered we covered ph we covered temperature we covered uh free so2 we covered uh, total acidity. We covered uh, repitching with uh, an acclimated starter of the same yeast. Yeah. We repitched with an acclimated starter of two other yeasts, which are known to be good at restarting stuff fermentations. Yep. yep. They all failed. And then one day, after all of our effort, it just starts going again. Sorry. Yeah, so a week later, <laughs> I don't know if it was on a union break or what. <laughs> it could have been. 
<laughs> but I feel like there's like a, a bad joke in here somewhere that it was your tailored prolific profanity edition. That- <laughs> <laughs> if you could, you know, it could be. Because uh, every morning when I got up, I would come around the corner and I'd peek my, my head in the window and I'd just look at it and cuss. Then I'd just walk away. <laughs> an, an alternative uh, <laughs> to the better known Tazda method. <laughs> yeah. So uh, for those of you out there who are having difficulty with your mead, uh, try cussing at it. Sometimes it just absolutely works. So, but but anyway, and if it doesn't work, it'll make you feel better. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so, uh, adding, uh, you know, we've talked about this in the past. I think we've only touched on it, though. You know, when it comes to making meads, um, and I think I think I think a lot of people out there like to do the flavored meads, whether it's got spices in it or or fruits, or some kind of flavoring. But I, what we really haven't gone into a whole lot of detail on is how do you treat that? How, how do you treat the fruits? What's involved? Uh, you know, and I, I know that you just can't chuck a bunch of peaches in the bucket and pour your water and honey in and mix it up and expect to be drinking peach mead in a couple you know months or whatever. It's not that simple, um, but how simple can it be? How simple is it actually? Somebody started. It, it's just that simple. <laughs> but don't you? Uh, I mean, there's a lot to be said out there uh, about how you treat the fruit before you even put it in the bucket. Um, you know, uh, obviously, you just can't take a peach and carve it up and chuck it in the bucket because there's a lot of things. Uh, that will happen to it uh, uh, to your mead before you even get get it off the ground. I mean, you've got contaminant yeasts in there that uh, are stuck to the skin, especially if you're using fresh picked fruit. Um, you know. Well, uh, let me it? let me run down uh, let, let me run down what I've been doing uh, for the last year year and a half. Um, and and Jeff already knows about this because I sent him that that nectarine uh, or peach recipe actually. Yeah. Um, there's a product called Lalazine. and uh, I think probably everybody that's been doing this for a while is familiar with with pectic enzyme. Uh, Lalazine is um, is a product made by Lalamon that uh, it does have pectic enzyme in it, but it also has quite a few other enzymes. And uh, so uh, this product will literally just turn fruit to juice and pulp in no time. Uh, usually about three, four, five days, depending on what the fruit is. So <clears throat> my method, uh, you know, I always had this problem where I would set the gravity on my mead and then add the fruit in. And then over the course of the next day or so, my gravity would drop drastically due to being diluted from the fruit juice. And that always bugged me because you never can predict how much dilution you're going to get, and you can't set an accurate gravity. And that always bugged me. And uh, so I, I started thinking of how I could fix this. And so basically what you do, uh, what I've been doing, is get some empty buckets, five-gallon, uh, whatever you need to, to hold your fruit, crush that fruit up in that bucket, add in your sulfites, uh, which will help to sterilize it and preserve it, and it'll keep it from fermenting over the next few days, and uh, then add in your lilozyme and stir it up good, put the lid on it, seal it airtight, so that you maintain your sulfites in there. They don't dissipate. And uh, so that solves two problems. It kills any wild yeast or organisms, and it also breaks it down into just uh, uh, gets all the juice out. Anything good, color, flavor, uh, aroma, juice, everything comes out. So you don't so put any after water. You don't you don't put any water in it uh, at all. You just put your chemicals in, put the lid on, and walk away. Uh, it depends on the fruit. Some some fruit is so low in water content that you need to add a little just to get uh, your sulfites and and the lilozyme to be dissolved. 
Okay. Uh, but not nothing excessive. Um, and you can leave that in there for um, like maybe four days, five days. Um, at the end of the time, though, whenever you're about finished, what you need to do is take the lid off and cover it with a cloth. And you need to stir it about every six or eight hours for for a period of 24 hours to dissipate that SO2. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, it's gonna it's not gonna ferment very well, or it'll be sluggish. So, um, uh, but but you keep a lid on for the for the time that you're letting the enzymes work. Um, that way, you you maintain your your sulfite level to keep it sterile and keep it from fermenting. And then uh, you got you know then if you want to, you can strain the juice out. Uh, you don't have to worry about dilution. Uh, you can put that right in with your honey, set your starting gravity. And then if you feel like it, you know, if you really want to, go ahead and put the pulp in. Uh, but honestly, by the time the lalazine finishes working on it for four or five days, there's really not much left in the pulp except maybe some, uh, yeah, there might be some, some tannins left that you might get benefit from, but most of the stuff you're looking for is going to be in the juice by that time. Yeah. So you don't need uh, – do you use a fruit bag or no? You just uh, – uh, No, you can. I mean, it, it makes it easier to strain. Uh, you can pull it up out of the uh, juice and hang the bag over the bucket and let it drain. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can do it that way, or you can just do it right in the bucket and then and then strain it out as you go. Um, either way works fine. It, it's sort of a mess, regardless of how you do it, uh, but it's really effective. And you kill two birds with one stone. You set you sanitized your fruit and you've extracted everything there is to extract from it. Yeah. And this is long before you pitch your yeast or do anything to it. You're just prepping the fruit at this point. Now, what about, uh, you know, what I've always read everywhere you go out there when you're, you know, you're talking melomels, uh, the big, uh, you know, recommendation, the one that most everybody recommends is to freeze the fruit. Now, using Chris's method, uh, it almost sounds like you. It's really kind of a no-brainer. You don't have to do that. No, uh, you don't have to. Uh, the Lalazine is an amazing product, and uh, when you get it, if you, if you go buy some and you look on their site, uh, the amount that you need to use is really, really small. And your first instinct is to measure it out, and you look at it, and you say, gosh, this is not going to do anything. It's just a little pinch. Uh <laughs> But it doesn't. It doesn't take much. Uh, even a massive amount of fruit is just just a tiny, tiny bit. But it does wonders. So uh, I don't know, Jeff. Uh, you know, the crushed thing, a frozen thing. It almost sounds like it's really not necessary. Yeah, to an extent, it does sound like. Uh if you can do it that way, that's the the benefit. I apologize here. My, my two year old is screaming in the background. Um, no, I've been, I've been freezing my fruit, uh, despite picking up some of this lyles, I'm to start breaking stuff down. Um, mainly just to keep it fresh ish, um, until I'm ready to work with it because I've been a little bit fruit crazy this year. And my, uh, my motivation to do things lately has been a little bit lacking as I've been trying to get the, uh, the, this, uh, refrigerator cut down into shape so I can ferment in it too. And, uh, I'm just trying to avoid summer heat and the, the nasty off flavors that that would undoubtedly give the heat if I tried to, to make anything without a fermentation vessel in place. Yeah. Aaron, have you, uh, have you worked on any mellow bells in this fashion at all or, uh, have any experience with it? No. And I just, I have to say, I think I've had a question that has kind of, been in the back of my mind for several months answered just now. Um, I, I've always wondered about people that add their fruit to the primary. We, we talk about sanitizing the must and sanitizing the fruit by using 
potassium at a bisulfite, Camden ta- tablets and things like that. Yeah. And I've always wondered, how is it that you can add those ingredients or those chemicals in and then turn around and add yeast, you know, in, in a day or two in, in such a way that it would the, be an environment that the yeast could survive in. Um, yeah. and, and it sounds like from what Chris was saying, it, while it's airtight, it, those sulfites won't like evaporate or leave the must. But then if you open it up, is that, is that correct? That like by opening it, that allows those sulfites to escape and, and then you'd be okay to, um, to pitch the yeast at that point. Yeah. Yeah. But you need uh, a minimum of 24 hours, uh, in the open air and and it really helps if you stir it often during that time to help dissipate that SO2 um, it, it really wouldn't hurt if you could leave it covered with a cloth for even 36 hours um, because I have had some that were sluggish if, if you overdo the sulfites just a little bit it can take some time for them to get out uh, as a general rule, 24 hours is good. Um, but yeah, just uh, just cover it with a cloth so that they can dissipate, and and stir it every six or eight hours for 24 or 36 hours, and it's good to go. Cool. Do you, okay. Do you use the Camden tablet tablets, uh, Chris, or do you use the powdered? Uh uh, I've used both. Uh, right now, I've got a, a bottle of the powder uh, because I've got some gram scales that I can measure accurately with. But uh, I used to use the tablets, and it's all the same. Uh, so, yeah, I, I never could tell any difference. Um, as a matter of fact, I've uh, I've got the powder because I'm currently using that to sanitize my equipment. I, I tend to rotate through sanitizers. And uh, so I go through sulfite for a while, and then I use star sand for a while, mm-hmm. and iota for. And I'm just happen to be on sulfites right now. The only drawback to sulfites is that you have to rinse everything. Um, yeah. Someone said one time, you know, why would you want to sanitize it if you're just going to rinse it with unsanitized water? Well, it's the same water I'm making up my mead with. If it's clean enough for that. <laughs> enough to rinse your equipment with. Yeah, you'd think. And that's yeah, what we're, I mean, we're and, talking. And what Aaron said, uh, I'm sorry, what Aaron said about sanitizing the fruit, before I started doing it this way, I've made lots and lots of mellow mills uh, and just mix up the must, put the fruit in, do nothing to it, and never had a problem. Yeah. Um, I'm sure sooner or later you're going to get an infection somewhere or you're going to get a wild yeast that takes over, but I guess I just got lucky. Um, and we're talking uh, we're talking potassium metabisulfite, right? We're not talking potassium sorbate. That's going to take it no. in the other direction and you'll never get anywhere. But we're talking that's right. potassium metabisulfite. That's right. Yeah. So don't, uh, you know, please don't confuse the two because, you know, both are quite often used at the end to uh, kind of stabilize everything out. So uh, remember, potassium metabisulfite is the one you want to use on your fruit. So that's, uh, you know, uh, that's actually kind of pleasing to me because, uh, you know, uh, the few that I have made – I've gone through this whole freezing thing, leaving the freezer for a couple of days, and then you got to wait for it all to thaw out. And then you, I've been using pectic enzyme, but I think I'm going to switch brand and go to this uh, olalazine uh, and give that a try. Um, uh, but the standard, uh, you know, I think the standard uh, procedure out there is to, you know, you put your fruit in. Uh, mix up your honey, your water, throw in the pectic enzyme, let it sit 24 hours, and then pitch your yeast. It almost sounds like it's the wrong approach. Uh, now that I listen to Chris talk about this lalazyme, letting the, I like the idea of letting the fruit sit and just macerate and just get all the potential uh, out of the fruit itself. What do you guys think? Yeah. And, you know, and the great thing about it, like I said, is you, you, you can be accurate with your starting gravity that way. Uh, strain out the juice, which is all the good stuff, 
put mix your meat up with that, and uh, then once you get your gravity set, then you can go ahead and dump in the pulp and and all the other stuff if you want. Yeah. I'm not sure how much benefit you'll get from that other than some tannins, but uh, you know it's another layer of, of complexity in the mead, so I normally do, but I, I strain the juice first so I can set my gravity accurately. So we're talking, uh, you know, we're, we're basically talking stone food. You know, you talk nectarines, peaches, uh, that kind of thing. What about berries, uh, strawberries, blackberry? Uh, we're looking at the same procedure here? Same thing, all, all fruit. And, uh, you know, you can help it along by crushing it in the bucket before you put your, your enzyme in. Uh, and, and some things you really need to crush, some things you don't, but I usually just crush it all anyway. Um, things like black currants or, or thick skinned grapes like muscadines or something like that, mm-hmm. uh, those really need to be crushed regardless, uh, because the skin is so tough and thick on them. Uh, something like strawberries, you probably wouldn't really have to, um, but I do anyway, just to be on the safe side and speed things along a little. Yeah. Is there any particular fruit that wouldn't work in that method? Well, none that I've used so far. Um, you know, I, I guess you're going to get more benefit from that method from certain fruits. Things, I guess, berries, probably you might get more benefit than you would um from plums or melons or peaches or something. But if I was going to make a, a melon mel, I'd do it anyway, regardless of the fruit. Follow the same procedure, keep things consistent. And, uh, you know, then there's no doubt you're extracting everything you possibly can from it. Yeah. Jeff Aaron, is there any particular fruit uh, out there that, I mean, you know, the norm is the the peach and, you know, all the berries and whatnot, but is there something out there that, something unusual that uh, you're thinking about at least? You know, as you mentioned that, one thought that just popped in my head was, um, it's a fruit called carambola, or you, you may have heard it or seen it at the grocery store, star fruit. It's like a yellow fruit that grows in, in pretty warm climates. Actually, when I grew up in Florida, we had a, a carambola tree in the backyard. And, um, you know, as I'm thinking about it, I remember there was like a winery down there in like the Sarasota, Tampa area that made like a carambola fruit wine that was just out of this world. And it, it has a a very delicate flavor. Um, it's kind of hard for me to describe what star fruit tastes like, but I bet that would be tremendous in a melamel. That sounds good. Yeah, Jeff, anything up your way that uh, you'd like to get your hands on? And well, actually, I'm, I'm I've got a couple things I'm curious about more than anything. We've discovered uh, growing along our fence line at, in the backyard. Uh, not only do we have a a pretty uh, big little cluster of mulberry bushes, mm. um, I also have uh, an elderflower plant uh, along my back fence line. I discovered so I've been gathering up some of those berries too. Okay. Yeah, elderberry wine is quite popular in Europe. I know that. I had a, there was a local winery here that I think folded at one point or another, but um, they had an elderberry port that was phenomenally delicious. Mm. Um, a little bit dangerously so, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I love a good port. <laughs> Interesting. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, spices, uh, kind of the flip side of fruits. and what, Well, you know, before we, before we do that, Chris, you know, when it comes to apples, uh, another thing that I really like uh, is a nice apple wine. And I'm not talking about the Martinelli sweet type apple wine type stuff uh, that is sometimes common. I'm talking about a nice semi-dry to dry apple wine uh, that's got some nice apple aromas. Uh, 
uh, you know, I, I suppose you could treat it like a sizer, apple juice and honey. But what about using apples uh, along with this Laozyme product and, you know, going through those steps? You still accomplish the same thing? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, that that may be one exception because, I, and I haven't got to that yet because I don't know how I'm going to approach it. Uh, you and I had a conversation a while back about uh, cider, uh, cider seasons coming up in the fall. Yes. And uh, I always look forward to when the apples start coming in. Um, and I'm actually working on a uh, plans for a homemade cider press. Um, awesome. something that anybody can, can make at home and use. And uh, so I've got to make a grinder of some sort, and uh, I've got plans for that already and uh, plans for the uh, for the press. And I'm not sure, I, after, after those things are ground and pressed to the point where uh, the, the pulp is left so dry that it just forms a cake, I don't know if the lalazine would would actually help in that situation. Yeah. Um, I really don't know, but I do know that I have always taken extra care uh, with the sulfites and and apples. Uh, apples are one of those things that just naturally carry a lot of yeast, pretty wild notorious. yeast. Yeah, very notorious. And. Yeah, they, they carry a lot of wild yeast for some reason, and that is the one fruit that I always sulfite, always. Uh, I don't think I've ever made a sizer uh, that I didn't sulfite unless it was pasteurized juice from the store. Well, let's say, I mean, you know, even if you weren't going to make a traditional sizer, we're talking, you know, jugs of apple juice and, or, you know, cider, honey, and, and yeast. Uh, you know, we're talking, you know, a five gallon bucket of cut up apples, uh, you know, going through the whole process, uh, you know, sulfite and lalazime, 36 hours or whatever. Do you think you could accomplish the same? I mean, you know, the end result here is, you know, some kind of wine, some kind of mead. Uh, obviously you're going to use, you know, honey in place of the, of the sugar, but, uh, you know, so you, you're looking for the same result here. Uh, mm-hmm. So if you didn't have the fruit press and the grinder and all of that, uh, mm-hmm. and you didn't want to spend, like me, $15 a gallon on fresh apple cider. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, you're saying, that, would it work? Yeah. Yeah, it, it probably would, although I've never tried it. But come this fall, uh, we will try it and we'll get an answer. Yeah. Very good. All right. Um, yeah. Well, let's, uh, you know, and, and this is something that we could probably spend a whole lot more time on, too, but uh, we'll let our audience uh, uh, kind of guide us that way. Um, something else that, uh, and, and I know Jeff has spent a lot of time doing this, uh, working with spices and teas and, and that kind of thing. And, uh, Jeff, I'm still eager. My, my hibiscus is still sitting over there in the corner, still kind of doing its thing, just letting it uh, kind of run its own course. Um, I, I, I like how it's coming together. And, of course, this is hibiscus flowers and uh, what was the other? Um, Chamomile. Yeah, cr- chamomile and one other ingredient. Uh, yeah, there's a little bit of sumac in there. Sumac, yeah. Um, talk about putting spices and, and teas and working with, with, with teas and whatnot. How, uh, how do you go about that? Well, um, like any other flavor, you know, you want to choose things that go well together. They need to go complement the, the honey. They need to complement each other. They need to complement anything else besides the spices. That's all basic stuff. Um, as far as getting spices out of the, uh, the getting flavors out of the spices, um, there are a couple different approaches to it. Um, one of the things that makes this, um, well, to take this back to a basic 
like high school chemistry class, there are essentially two kinds of molecules we're concerned with here. There's polar molecules and nonpolar molecules. Um, polar molecules are things like water that have the, the potential to have a, uh, an ionic charge. Um, and there are nonpolar molecules that don't have that charge. Um, and those are things like alcohol. Uh, what this is important in is that essentially, um, if we're going to do a tea or a tincture, they basically work the same way, but they work on different compounds. So a tea process will, will basically use a polar, uh, solvent like water to uh, get flavors out of um, get out of, get out of the herb or the spice with a tincture we're going to use a nonpolar sol- solvent um, in this case alcohol uh, to get those same flavors out any kind of alcohol I feel alcohol um, I would I would honestly get a uh, um, well I mean vodka versus bourbon versus rum or all of the any kind of alcohol will do the job. The uh, the the thing to consider is the other flavors that that alcohol base is going to add. Yeah. Um, what I've when I've previously tried to make tinctures, and I've not done a lot of these. Um, I used uh, Everclear, the the ninety nine percent grain mm-hmm. alcohol, and oh my god, does that have a really hot aftertaste? Um, yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's and like moonshine. <laughs> yeah. After I tried that tincture, I kind of had second thoughts about ever putting anything like that into a mead. Um, what I would recommend at this point, what I've been doing a little bit here and there uh, lately, has been using uh, essentially like a, a big box store vodka and um, yeah. letting that be the dilute tincture. Um, Costco has a, a fairly inexpensive and fairly like flavored neutral uh brand that they uh they sell in uh, massive bottles for like twenty dollars kirkland. Um, kirkland brand yep the kirkland yep. the kirkland generic it is uh pretty fantastic for this purpose i've found um yeah and, the, and another benefit of that is that you've got some water in there so if you if you do have uh compounds that can be extracted more readily with water than you're getting both. That is correct. Um, and this is, this kind of harkens back to Patty's method of, uh, doing the, um, the cold brew, mm-hmm. um, with the coffee. You know, we're, we're talking about, um, a solvent that it's extracting flavor from beans and it may be a polar solvent in the case of the water in the mead. It may be a nonpolar solvent in the case of the alcohol that we brewed up. Okay. All right. I think he just went on mute. <laughs> I know his daughter's been uh, raising hell tonight. Two years Sorry. old, but she's got to be a cute, uh, uh, a cutie pie for sure. Uh, he, Go ahead. Yeah, but he's a little. Uh, oh, he, he, Sorry, he's <laughs> problematic tonight. We're we're having a heck of a time getting him to sleep. Um, <laughs> Yeah, maybe, he your, maybe he got into your meat stash. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he'd be quite that cranky if he did. Well, my daddy <laughs> used to drop a little bit of Jack Daniels into my bottle, and uh, apparently that put me right to sleep. But I uh, used to piss my mom off. But what the heck? Uh, like your ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now look at me. Uh, and, anyway. you know, you're, you're doing a podcast about alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. yeah, pardon me for uh, for saying girl, boy, uh, two year old little boy. But uh, uh, anyway, Jeff, go ahead. Uh, keep talking, but I, I like so, what you're talking about here. Right. Um, the the idea is that we're we're taking different approaches to getting the. Uh, the flavors out of these herbs and spices, and what I've used most, most, uh, most frequently here has been a tea approach. Uh, essentially, brewing up um, a specific amount of uh, the the material we're getting flavor out of with water, and uh, replacing the the water in the mead with that tea. Um, I like that approach because it gets it lets the mead act on it. Um, I'm sorry, it lets the yeast act on it uh, in the fermentation and kind of adds to that uh, 
the, the yeast esters and things like that. Um, there are there are certainly other ways to go about this. I mean, obviously, a lot of people prefer to add the spices in secondary uh, or even just before, you know, stabilizing and packaging, um, so that there's that much less potential for the yeast to, to act on it um, in an unfavorable way. Um, I've not had that much problem with yeast doing that, but I've also, you know, I'm I'm also still uh, experimenting on my own here. I uh, I had a I just recently had a a pretty bad experience with spices, and uh, I uh, was at uh, Trader Joe's and was walking past the juice uh, the the cold uh, uh, storage, uh, uh, and they've got apple juice, really good apple juice, uh, apple cider. It's, it's fresh, fresh pressed. And so I picked up a gallon, and I thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to try this, uh, you know, with some uh, pumpkin pie spices. And so I, I put it all together, um, got it fermented out, tasted great, and got it into secondary. And I put a teaspoon of just regular old McCormick's pumpkin pie spice wrapped it up in a, uh, a, a neutral paper coffee filter, stapled it shut, and, uh, you know, stapled a little sanitized cotton cord to it, and dropped it into the, second, or the secondary. And, uh, you know, I would taste it and pull it out and taste it and pull it out. It got to the point where it just, it just went bad. It just went south. I mean, it was a god-awful taste. And, uh, you know, all during my tasting, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting on it. You know, uh, any minute now, it's going to start tasting. I'm going to get this cinnamony, clovish, pumpkin pie, spice, nutmeg flavor. Well, it never came around. And it just, it just tasted like blah. Uh, so that helped flush the drain out here uh, in uh, Southern California as well. So... How do you treat these? I mean, how do you know how much is too much or how much is good? And is it better to use whole spices or, you know, like uh, maybe I, I don't know what I did, might have done wrong. Uh, but, uh, you know, powdered spices, do they really work? I don't know if there's a, a difference between whole and powdered. Um so much as fresh and packaged. Um, my, my instinct is always to try and buy the freshest spices I can get my hands on. And I have a, a really good spice guy at our, our local market um, who has consistently reliable, really high quality uh, product. Um, so if I'm going to put something in a, a fermenter, I try and get it from him whenever possible. Um, the, you would probably get a better ag, Extraction from a powdered spice, um, just simply because of the amount of surface area available to it. Um, if, if I were going to go that route, though, I would probably grind it myself in a little coffee grinder before I introduced it um, and start from something fresh and whole. Um, that would just be my preference. Generally, also, when, when the spices are ground up like that, they tend to become uh, exposed to oxygen and uh, well, the, the potential for staleness, essentially, yeah. um, a lot faster. The same with, you know, ground coffee, anything else, really. Um, you, you start losing some of the flavor compounds once you break through that, uh, the, the natural packaging of the, the seed or nut or bark or whatever you're using. Well, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe that there are some oil compounds in the spices, much like coffee. I mean, there's an oil in coffee beans that do contribute to the flavor, the overall flavor uh, as well. So I'm wondering if, you know, these dried McCormick spices that I'm using out of a bottle has just lost all that. And, uh, I mean, it might be good in pumpkin pie, but it's just not good in some kind of a liquid, uh, you know, that you're putting together. So perhaps the whole spice... Mm-hmm. Uh, fresh whole spice uh, might be the direction I need to go. I definitely want to try it again. Yeah, I, I would suggest that. I mean, e- either a, um, I don't know the name of the company, but I know there is a, a, a an internet supply house for spices that uh, I've heard a number of people recommend. Um, 
Penzies. In- Penzies. Thank you. That's I've never purchased from there myself, but I've heard good things from a number of people. So if I were going to, to try and find something I couldn't source locally, um, that would probably be a direction for me to check out. Um, There's a beer but, called uh, World Spice that's also really very good. What's it called, Chris? World Spice? World Spice and uh, Penzies. Those two are the two best that I know of. Yeah, vanilla also has uh, some spices, but they cater more to to the vanilla stuff. But um, Aaron, have you messed around with the spices and and tinctures, tinctures and teas and whatnot? Mm-hmm. Not very much, in my experience. I think the I'm just racking my brain right now. The only mead that I've done that. I used spices in was the Joe's ancient orange. You know, I guess one of, one of the thoughts I'm having about it and just in, in general, it seems like fruits versus spices. And let me know you guys' thoughts about this, but it seems like with fruits, you add that in and it's almost like that becomes the flavor that you want to highlight in that mead, whether like we've talked about, you know, peaches or cherries or berries, raspberries. Whereas with spices, and and this is one of the things that that I found with the Joe's ancient orange. And and really I I should do more experimentation with spices. When you add different spices together, they kind of like blend and, and meld together over time and, and become something different, something greater than, you know, the sum of the parts, so to speak. It's just, it's interesting how the flavor can evolve like that. Mm-hmm. And that is the strength of the, the hibiscus and chamomile meat that I did too. That either one of them makes a pretty good meat all by itself, but the two of them together is like, Hey, that's, that's pretty fantastic. Actually. Yeah. Um, they, they just really complement each other in a solid way. And, um, yeah, no, the, they're, the, I think, um, I think you're onto something when people add fruit to a mead, the fruit kind of becomes, along with the honey, the, the central thing. Um, I'm not sure you would ever make like a, like an allspice or a nutmeg mead. Um, although. Oh yeah. Good. Yeah. I got a good nutmeg mead for you. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Nutmeg is a very powerful spice that I know just from cooking, and I know clove is too. But uh, oh yeah, nutmeg. Oh, I got a beautiful, I got a beautiful nutmeg mead recipe for you if you want it. Mm. I I would take you up on that actually, um, but I, I think in general the uh, the instinct here is kind of to treat uh, to treat mead like a dessert. So you, you would want a a fruit pie, not necessarily a spice pie, but there would be, um, good point. Additions of spices into the fruit to, to kind of bring out those fruit flavors. Yeah. I, I I think I'm making sense here. And if you want to know what happens over time with the, with the JAO, I've got one that's like, I don't know, six, seven years old. It's like the first thing I ever made. And, uh, so if you want to try it, I'll be happy to send it to you. And please don't send it back. <laughs> <laughs> I could, huh? <laughs> well, you know, I get this thing. I mean, the JAO, I mean, I, I suppose there's a reason for it somewhere. I just haven't found it yet. But I'm of the firm belief that if you really want to get started making mead, choose something simple like we've got on our website a real mead, the honest to God, the the orange blossom thing. You can scale it down to a one gallon thing if you just want to go, you know, lesser expensive, uh, you know, and and try it out. Uh, that would be because then you're going to get the authentic thing in the end. But um, well, I'm going to give you something free of charge uh, for those of you, and I know there's a lot of people who've made the JAOs. And they're, if you like them and you want to drink them, then, you know, go ahead, be my guest. But for those of you who made it and you go, well, I just don't think I want to drink this, uh, I'll tell you how you can salvage it. Uh, take that J.O. and mix it about half and half with some Sprite or 7-Up and make a Mead Mosa. Made uh, uh, there you go. Uh, spritzer. It makes a it makes a really good spritzer about half and half with uh, 
Sprite or Seven Up or ginger ale. <laughs> I, I usually use Sprite. There you and, go. And makes a good good little mixer. <laughs> There you go. I'll have, I'll have to give that a try. I've got several bottles of uh, JAO sitting down there in the basement, so that might be a good use for them. <laughs> it's just it's just too sweet by itself, and uh, uh, so you know if you want to lessen that, you can go with some ginger ale or something, uh, maybe even some seltzer water. But uh, the Sprite does pretty good. There you go. Um, then, well, you know, I I think I may enjoy the JAO a, a little more than than you guys, and, and I will yeah. say one of the things I I really liked about it was just the spices and how you know you're taking the the cinnamon and the cloves and, and is that the only two or is that am I missing one there? But you know they they no, oh, the orange and the, cinnamon cloves yeah no you're right yeah uh, no oranges yep all and spice. Just, yeah. You know, I suppose it would probably be a better mead if you use something like a 71B or, uh, you know, something along the line. I mean, just, you know, just the, the bread yeast thing, just, I don't know. I just, uh, I know it works, but. I hear you, though. I, and, and I will also say, I think now that I've started adopting some better mead making practices and, and the quality of my just traditional meads and things like that is, is increasing. I'm, I'm really sold on, on those methods, but um, just the, the JAO, it, it is interesting how those spices, you take the orange, the, the clove, all spice and cinnamon for distinct flavors, four separate things. And they just kind of combine over time into yeah. something something different, and uh, it's, and it's for, just interesting. Uh, and for those of you who are struggling trying to figure out how to get the wedges of oranges out of your one-gallon jug, I got an easy solution <laughs> for that. Take it, take it to the garbage uh, dumpster and just toss it in the trash, go back to the store, pick up a bottle, one of those one-gallon jugs of wine, and, uh, you know, in no time at all, you'll have yourself a brand new car, boy. So. <laughs> there you go. Um, well, I blew up a balloon inside mine. A balloon? Yeah, I put the balloon inside and turned it upside down so the orange slices came to the mouth of the jug and then blow the balloon up and pull it out, and it pulls the orange slices with it. <laughs> That's got to be a leftover from some surgical practice or something. It sounds like. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it's a it's a procedure we use in endarterectomies to to clean out an artery. Uh, they, you can clean out a carotid artery like that with a little inflatable balloon. I'm glad you didn't say something along the lines of an enema or something. But uh, all right. So, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> we could talk more, uh, I'm sure, on this spice. I mean, you know, all of this stuff, we're just not done. We're not ever done talking about this stuff. That's the whole purpose of this show is just to come on and, and you know, discuss the different aspects about making mead. I want to move on to something else while we have the third best in the world. And let's see. How did you? How did Chris put it? Number third, number three. He's best the one best third best in the, the world. One, the one third best in the world mead maker right here amongst us, uh, and he's also a judge, a bona fide, uh, authenticated mead judge. Jeff, I want to get into a discussion about how to taste and how to evaluate your your mead. Uh, sure. You know, we spend a lot of money these days buying good honeys, and of the, the well, even the you know your labor has to be worth something at some point as well. But all of the product that you put into your to your mead, uh, what are we looking for in the end? Uh, what, what are we What are we supposed to expect in the end? Uh, how do we evaluate uh, our end result? Well, you you want something you enjoy drinking? Yeah, you know what? And life <laughs> life life is exactly that simple for me because I'm of the opinion that if it tastes good, I'll buy another bottle. 
if it doesn't taste good to me, I won't buy another bottle. That's how simple it is. But I know it goes deeper than that. Sure. It really that is all the more complicated you need to make it unless you're going to enter stuff in competitions. Um, the, <laughs> Make a mead you enjoy drinking and make a mead your friends and family enjoy. Um, that's really what this hobby is about. Um, if you do want to, to, um, make a, a mead for competition, I can go into how that's judged and I'm happy to. Um, there are a bunch of different categories that we look at when we're, we're talking about, uh, mead. Um, the, uh, the first category you're going to look at after you've kind of poured out your sample of mead, and generally when you're evaluating a mead at competition, you serve that at room temperature, um, I believe. I'm, I've, I've always had it at room temperature. Um, that gives the most like volatile aromatics, uh, room to breathe. Um, a little bit of cold temperature can kind of hide some of the, the more delicate flavors as well. Um, so room temperature is really kind of the, the, the nice even spot to to catch everything. Um, The first part you look at after you pour that out is um, the bouquet and the aromatics. And um, the aroma of the mead is uh, kind of, it's the um, individual pieces like the honey or the fruit or the spices or whatever you're adding to it. Um, The bouquet is kind of the, the sum of all those parts and of the extra stuff. So in, in this part, um, when you're, if you're judging a mead, the recommendation is to kind of swirl the mead in the glass a little bit and tip it towards you and, uh, get your nose deep into the glass and take a big long draw, um, two or three seconds. Um, give yourself enough time to take a couple deep breaths away from the glass, then do, um, the, the idea there is to get like really, really close to the, the meat itself, uh, right up against the surface. Um, give yourself a, a kind of a, a, a chance to clear your, your sinuses, um, another couple squirrels, and then try to put your nose up to the, the far edge of the glass. So it's a little bit further away from the, the, the meat in the glass. Um, that will give you a, a sense of the lighter aromatics at play. Um, then an, another sniff um, would go probably two or three inches above the glass. Um, that that gets very light aromatics. And then finally, um, what a lot of us do will, would be to put like our noses kind of right up against the the glass, held flat rather than tipping it like we did before, uh, and take a couple quick like yeah. that. Kind of gives you the round perception of all these different aromatics that are going into it. Um, you, you can get different things at different times um, by, by sniffing it in different ways. Um, another thing I've seen people do, and I've tried it a couple times without a lot of difference, but it, it still may be valuable, um, is to take the glass in both hands um, and kind of cover it with one hand, uh, wrap the your other hand around it and swirl it a little bit and that acts to warm the meat a little bit as well. Uh, and that can release some more volatile aromatics. Mm-hmm. Um, what we're looking for when we've got all these different smells and all these different aromatics is we're looking for, um, what's going on with the meat. So you're going to find things like the, the honey aroma. Um, there's going to be esters involved with the, the yeast. These are the flavors that were not originally in the yeast, but, I'm sorry, in the, the must of the mead, but they're things that come out. Like, for example, um, D47 has that characteristic green apple um, that it's it's known for throwing esters on. So that would be an example of something that you would get there. Uh, a lot of yeasts are known for um, throwing, like, stone fruit smells or esters. Um, they're the, uh, the German, like, Hefeweizen yeast throw that very uh, um, very ubiquitous banana and clove ester. Um, there's there's a lot of different stuff that can come into play here. Um, we're we're kind of looking for that. We're looking for how they all blend together. I mean, we we would want to avoid like a raw honey smell, uh, but the, the the kind of the perfume or the aroma of that honey should play through to some extent or another. Whether it's kind of a plain Jane wildflower or it's a, a varietal. Um, 
after you've evaluated the aroma, you want to look at the the uh, appearance of the mead. Um, the meads tend to come in uh, roughly this the same kind of scale of colors um, as honey when it comes to traditional. Um, your appearance can vary pretty widely from there, depending on what else you put into it. I mean. The fruits will obviously give it the, a, a similar color to the fruit. Um, spices can change the color of it. I've done the, the porter braggot that I keep talking about um, is very nearly an opaque black. Um, you, you get a wide variety of colors here. Um, the other thing you want to look at is clarity, uh, how, how clear the meat goes through. And obviously, for a competition mead, uh, clearer is, is judged as being better. Um, this is, this is kind of where I split hairs with, uh, judging in some ways as far as like something I would make for myself because I've had plenty of cloudy meads that tasted delicious. And then when I used like cold crashing or just time and this side or the other to, to get them to, uh, to clear later, I found I didn't like them quite as well. Hmm. Um, that it may be personal preference as well. Does the cloudiness have an effect on the taste of the meat at all? I think it depends on what causes the cloudiness. Um, and in, in my case, it may have been um, some some remnant yeast still in suspension, um, or some some yeast that had been uh, what I want to say. Um, stirred up a little bit in, in the process of bottling and had been uh, basically like mixed back into the, the, the meat itself um, that once it was you know sitting in a bottle for a couple of weeks it just like eh, no it's just not as good as when I bottled it um, so that, that's kind of my two cents on that that's obviously not every mead um, but yeah I, and I, if, I, if I could just jump in there for a second that's a good reason to use a bottling bucket uh, <laughs> jumping off the jumping off the uh, judging uh, subject onto procedures. While I'm thinking about it, use a bottling bucket. It's it's one extra step, I know, and you're going to lose a little bit of mead doing it. But you can avoid so much of that sediment if you do that. You have a point. Yes. Yeah. Um, and also, just being patient between the racking and racking from the bottling bucket into your bottles. You know, give stuff the time to settle out that it needs. You, you can save yourself some heartache and some, well, put it this way. I, I know as uh, a mead maker that the, the yeast sediment in the bottom is not going to hurt anything. And I'm fine with, you know, having a swig of it. Um, I've met very few people that take my word for it, that it's actually kind of good for you. Most of them are a little bit off put. It's not a lot off put. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah. I'd be more, I'd be one of those. <laughs> I'm just, the stuff on yeah. the bottom, I mean, mm-hmm. uh, well, I just got his mostly. See. It is mostly <laughs> dead yeast. Um, and dead yeast is actually pretty high in vitamin B12, which is, it, it's, um, it takes effort for our bodies to, to not make it, but kind of refine it. Um, so if we can get a good source of it from the yeast, you know, it's, it's one more thing. So yeah, the yeast so, are not going to hurt you at all, and and the only other thing that's going to be there most likely is fruit pulp, uh-huh. and that's no different than what you would if you ate a piece of fruit. So there's really nothing there that's going to hurt you. Right. So Doc, what you're saying is, along with my fish oil that I take every night, I should just down a couple of teaspoons of yeast too. I'm just saying, you know, turn it up and drink it, and don't worry about it. <laughs> You know, funny enough, they do they do have uh, brewer's yeast um, supplements at the health food store. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I'd rather just drink the beer. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I like get, get, you a good cloudy, get you a good cloudy wheat beer and drink it. Yeah, I like yeah. drinking my yeast when it's all done doing its thing and it's ice cold and tastes good. But uh, <laughs> what about tasting me, Jeff? Uh, no. Yeah, tasting what is are the we biggest looking component. At as far as the tasting component now, there is a lot going into taste. Obviously, uh, we, we talk about kind of the structure of the meat a lot. I talk about the structure of the meat a lot because it's important to get that right. 
And when I say the structure, I'm, I'm using their terminology. Um, it's, it's kind of the interplay between the, um, the sweetness of the mead, the acidity of the mead, and the, uh, the astringency of the mead. Those three kind of go together and they kind of, they need to be not quite equal, but they need to be pretty close in tandem. Um, they, they need to complement each other. And really from there, um, what we're looking for in a mead is balance. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of extra components that go into that. We want to, um, you're, you're going to talk about the, the presence of the alcohol in the mead because it's usually, you know, it's, it's a, it's an alcoholic drink. You're going to perceive something, whether it's a session strength, like a five or six percent on up, or if you've got something that's really, uh, really intense, like, you know, 18 to 20 percent, if you're really ambitious. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the presence of the alcohol needs to not detract from the other flavors. Um, the, the various flavors you put together, be they meat, spice, or sorry, fruit, spice, honey, um, those all need to play together nicely and kind of like complement or complement or elevate each other. Um, your honey varietal, if you've, if you've specified one, it needs to have that varietal character that's detectable there. Um, and if you've not specified one, and we're assuming it's a basic like, clover or uh, wildflower, or essentially just a nondescript honey, um, it, it still needs to have that that floral character of a hunt. Um, so we, we need to be able to tell that it is in fact a meat. Mm-hmm. Um, now this is also separate from mouthfeel, which is an entirely different animal. And mouthfeel covers a, a lot of different. Um, character that's things like the body. Um, this is actually where we talk about the astringency too, because that it gives you that characteristic little uh, the dryness or the pucker. And um, there's probably a lot of people out there who don't know what astringency astringency is. What, what exactly is that? What are we it's, talking? Uh, it, it's a little bit of that that kind of uh, um, the the um, the bitterness or the pucker. Um, you get uh, right towards the end. You see this from um, if you if you take like um, I get the most of it from like grapes. Um, that that kind of a, it's it's almost like a little bit of a bite from those. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the best way I know how to describe it without saying oh it's it's just that astringent taste. Mm-hmm. Okay. Jeff, the the word that comes to mind is almost like a sharpness. That, uh-huh. That's a word I always throw around a lot. So so maybe what what I would call is like a sharp flavor. Is this right. astringency? Okay. Yeah, and it's it's um, you know, like I said, the um, fresh grapes. If you bite into one, you you kind of get that bitterness, especially from the skin. Um, yeah. Where yeah. It, it's it's not exactly bitter. It's not exactly acidic, but you can you can not only taste it, but feel it, um, on your, your tongue and on your palate. Um, but there's, th- there's an effect there and that the feeling you get is the astringency. Um, the flavor perception is bitterness. If that makes sense. Yeah, if, if there's anyone out there listening who makes homemade pickles, uh, and you use alum to make pickles mm-hmm. like we do, yeah. if you want to know the definition of astringency, Put the tip of your finger in the alum and stick it to your tongue. You'll find out really quickly what astringency is. <laughs> uh, you'll be lucky. You'll be lucky if your mouth doesn't suck your eyeballs into it <laughs> when you fuck her. That yeah. sounds uh, like that. It sounds like the end result of that pumpkin mead that I made. The how did I put it? Yeah. Licking the inside of a galvanized pipe. But anyway, go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> Yeah, that, that pucker is characteristic of astringency. Um, it, it, it's one of those defining characteristics of it. Um, and, and like I said, the, the feeling of that is the it, part of the mouse feel. That, that's what we refer to as astringency. The taste perception of the bitterness that generally comes with that um, is, is part of the flavor. So those are kind of evaluated separate from each other, too. Yeah. Um, but we, we're also... Uh, looking for things like, you know, the, the warmth on your palate from the alcohol. Um, so it, yeah. mouthfeel and flavor kind of go together, but kind of get evaluated separately at the same time. 
over uh, time, uh, you know, the, the thing that comes to mind, I mean, because a lot of people who don't have the ability to have a, an adequate cooling system are going to wind up with, a, you know, what's called a hot meat that's going to typically is something fermented in warm temperatures. You're probably right at the cusp of the acceptable level for fermentation for that yeast. Sure. Do these, uh, you know, in time uh, will help settle that particular, that heat down a little bit. Does time also affect the astringency and these other uh, components as well? It can to a lesser extent. The reason time settles that, that hot meat out is because the, the perception of hotness is related to fusel alcohols, which are, are different than the the, um, the ethyl alcohols that we're going for. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fusel alcohols have a... Um, they're Essentially, they're heavier molecules than the ethyl alcohols. Um, and the perception of them is a lot smaller a threshold for us. So even a very small amount in solution is is perceptible to us and it gives us that kind of that uh, that alcoholic burn uh, really easily. Yeah. Um, to some extent, if you especially if you don't like filter or find your mead pretty highly, um, having some of the yeast in there and um, well, not exactly working actively, but um, able to to autolyze and kind of just chill out with the mead, um, I'm told can can help uh, um, dissipate some of those fusel alcohols and break them down um, into um, more usable alcohol. And I I may be completely off on this. I'm uh, it's it's been a while since I've reviewed my um, the, the chemistry behind this part, but. Um, over time, it, it is possible for some of those useful alcohols to essentially like break down and be a little bit more palatable. Um, obviously, the better thing to do is just not make those in the first place and control your fermentation temperature so that the yeast throw as few of those as possible. Yeah. Um, yeah, the is as... also related to tannins. Um, <clears throat> some of those will settle out with time. Mm-hmm. Some of that will settle out. Um, acidity can also settle out to an extent, but really, it, it's uh, that it's not going to calm down as well as um, things like the fusel alcohols or the astringency will. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of other faults in, in mead that tend to go away with time, um, and I'm, I'm coming up a little bit short. Another common one is oxidization, but really, if you've got oxidization present, it's going to get worse. It's it's not going to get better. Yeah. 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 You know, an, another thing that that I've heard, I think Chris talk about in the past, and, and something I've noticed a little bit with one of my meads is how over time a, a mead can intensify in the sweetness that you have that's present. Yeah, that's that's generally due to the the honey uh, flavor coming back into it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I always think of fermentation as this sort of like a paint shaker. It, it really agitates everything, and it, the whole process of fermentation throws everything out of whack. And it needs a little bit of time to to settle down and come back. But as that as the honey character comes back. Um, you may perceive that it's getting sweeter. It's not actually getting sweeter, but your brain tricks you into saying, oh, that tastes like honey. That must be sweet. Mm-hmm. So so your perceived sweetness will, will increase. And I wonder if with part of that, it could be just the, the fusel alcohols. Is those kind of soften over time? What what that might do to the perceived sweetness as well. The the batch that I'm thinking about is one that I actually back sweetened, and um, not sure I'm the biggest fan of doing that either because I, it does have kind of a, a raw honey flavor to it. Yeah. But but definitely when it was younger, it had more intense fusel hot alcohol flavors, which in in kind of a weird way balanced with that sweetness in, sure. in kind of a nice way. And now that those fusels are kind of going away in, 
even though it's more mellow and it's softer, it, it's starting to taste sweeter and sweeter. And so um, just kind of interesting how that all plays together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you probably jumped the gun on, on back sweetening it. And, and that's the same thing that we've been talking about with adding uh, acid blend or tannin or anything. Uh, you really can't add that stuff until you give your meat time to settle down and 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 give it an honest uh, taste of you know what it's going to taste like in its final uh, form before you start making adjustments. And you certainly don't do it up front. Absolutely. Right. Well. So, uh, um... We're uh, we're about out of time, guys, and I, I really, uh, gosh, again, I mean, this is uh, another topic that we could probably spend, you know, the next hour talking about. I mean, the bottom line is, uh, you know, we're all looking to produce some nice, uh, uh, some nice uh, mead, some good tasting stuff, and knowing uh, what to look for when you do taste your mead. Uh, I think kind of helps that whole process out. I think I've learned uh, actually quite a bit listening to Jeff talking about the tasting and evaluating, uh, you know, the evaluation. Uh, at least I know what to look for, uh, you know, things that I can kind of keep in the back of my mind, even taking notes uh, to that effect. I never yeah. knew where to, you know, how, how do you take notes on them? I mean, yeah, it tastes good. It tastes good. Well, what am I tasting? You know, uh, I don't. I didn't know how to discern the astringency and the acidity, and how, how do you figure all that out and make notes of that? And uh, you know, and and because those are going to be the adjustments that you need to make in the future uh, to make your mead better. Uh, sure. I think you know. Well, and regarding regarding tasting and evaluating mead, you know, I I touched on it really briefly. Um, the BJCP, the, the organization that sponsors the, the mead judging accreditation that I have and um, that are they're basically they're the framework for judging any mead competition you're going to enter, um, they have their mead study guide available online. You can, for anybody listening at home, you can Google BJCP mead study guide and chapter 11 deals all with um, how to you know pour out a glass, evaluate it, do the, the aroma, the mouthfeel, the flavor, what to look for in appearance. It goes into a lot of depth, more than we have time for, frankly, um, in tonight's show. Yeah. Um, so it's really worth checking out. The whole document is really fantastic. It gives you a, a, an overview of different like varietals of honey, common like fruits and spices that people put into mead, um, just so that, you know, for judges, if you were going to encounter things like this commonly, um, we have a, a, a kind of a basic grounding of what to expect. Yeah. And uh, real quickly here before we uh, get off the air, I wanted to throw a shout out to Angie Colwell. Uh, and this is probably meant more. In fact, I think I sent Jeff, uh, didn't I send you an email? I think related to this. Something about a braggot. Uh, she talks about, you had mentioned it in, I think it was episode 13, she says. Uh, yeah, my, um, my Doshe and uh, Porter braggot. Yeah. Um, can uh, and I, and I know uh, you know I got your email back and I know that there you know you don't have all the notes and everything but uh, I suppose maybe we can work on that and see if we can't recover even from memory and that that would be something that I would actually be interested in doing and we might set something like this up as a uh, kind of one of those communal recipes like we did the cherry mead and the orange blossom. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, I am going to warn you here. Uh, the, for whatever reason, the braggots seem to take quite a long time to age before they are really in a, a solid, drinkable way. I mean, uh, I um, I let I got, this one age like eleven months before I even like enjoyed a glass of it, and it's it's sitting at a little over a year and a half now, and uh, I think it's finally to the point where it's it's really a, a crowd pleaser. God willing, I got nothing but time. So, <laughs> yeah, JD, we need to also touch real quickly on the cherry mead. Uh, yeah, we sh- we should be sitting on uh, on Malab and the cocoa at this point, and we've got a minimum of another week on that before we will think about tasting it. Okay. So. 
you should be in secondary on top of the cocoa and mala now. Leave it alone, and we'll talk about uh, what to do next week. Yeah. And uh, real quickly, uh, we got about uh, four and a half minutes, five minutes left. Let's throw it around the table. Uh, I want to know briefly what's in your hopper, and give me one recipe that you really – you haven't done yet, but you really want to do. Let's start off with Chris. Well, I don't have anything going in primary right now. Everything that I've got uh, laid aside in, in secondary or tertiary or, or aging vessels. Um, as far as what I want to do, um, I, I really want to do my black currant and uh, jalapeno. Um that just, for some reason, that keeps coming to my mind that that's going to be a good one. That's and uh, because it's so, the, the black currant is so rich in flavor, it's got so much body to it. And and to me, uh, just a little bit of burn from, from pepper seems to sort of thin out uh, the perceived body in a mead. So I'm thinking that those two are going to, uh, they're either going to play nicely together or they're going to have a big fight in the bucket and not get along at all. So uh, we're not going to know till we try it. We, uh, we came back from North Carolina with a whole suitcase full of wine. One of them, uh, and of course, the wineries in, in, in the east back there, I mean, they're all muscadine wine because regular wine grapes don't grow back there, but... Uh, the one particular bottle that we came back with from uh, Duplin Winery is a jalapeno. Actually, it's a habanero. Uh, my wife just absolutely loves it, and I know her. her I know Aaron. I think is the uh, 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 also a, a pepper lover as well. So let's just jump it over to Aaron. Uh, wh- what do you got in the hopper, and what's on your wish list, bud? Yeah, so I, I'm in the same state as Chris where all my stuff is in secondary or tertiary at this point. Um, still aging and waiting to clarify on the three hop variety meads. Um, I've also got a, a three gallon batch of just a wildflower traditional aging and tertiary. And then lastly, the, the coffee boche mead. In terms of something that has been on my to-do list, and and this is something that's been on my list for years, and uh, honestly, the only reason I haven't gotten around to it is is because I have kind of shifted my focus more to just straight-up traditional meads, um, would be a braggot. I really like, you know, like real dark ale stouts and porters, but I also am, am a hop head as well and, and a really, really over the top hoppy IPA. You know, I'm a sucker for that too. Um, so I've, I've had this on my list for years, but like a, a hoppy porter style meat or like a black IPA style braggot, um, is, is something that, that's been on my list for a while. Outstanding. And, uh, finally, Jeff, uh, what you got in the hopper, or if anything, and uh, what's on your wish list? Oh, man. Um, I've got a little bit in the hopper. My uh, my chirimwe is in tertiary, and it's still pretty rough. Um, I'm, every, anytime I taste it, I'm, I'm kind of tempted to just give up and toss it down the drain, and I still may. Um, it, it just did not come through in the way that I was hoping it would, and um, it's, it's actually kind of vile tasting. Um, the... <laughs> The uh, the coffee mead, um, well, we, we talked about that earlier. I, I want to you know pump up that coffee flavor a little bit. Um, I've I've also got the hop mead that, um, boy, as soon as I've got the fermentation chamber fixed up, I, I can make another uh, batch of mead to cut that with because the hops is just too strong in there. Um, as far as um, stuff on deck, I have a lot. Um, I have. About three and a half pounds of mulberries, um, mm. a pretty substantial amount of nectarines, some red plums, um, some uh, um, apricots. Um, I, I said going into the summer that I wanted to learn um, uh, learn my melon melons here, and I'm 
I've got the supplies to do it. I just don't have a, a good place to, to turn out quality meat yet until I get this, uh, the shelving situation in this fridge fixed. Yeah. Um, as far as stuff that I've been wanting to try for a while and haven't gotten to yet, um, actually, the, the thing that's itching on the back of my mind right now uh, is actually the, the capsaicin oil, uh, the pepper mead. Um, just because I have a bunch of pepper and tomato plants in my garden that Historically, I have been terrible at growing things. I, I've, uh, plants have died left and right by my hand, just from either from negligence or uh, over exuberance or this, that, or the other. And finally, this year, I'm doing something right because they are um, they are flowering and fruiting like crazy, and I have huge amounts of peppers that are coming into to ripeness here. And I'm kind of thinking in the back of my mind, what what can I do with these uh, outside of just make a ton of salsa? Do like I do and cuss at it. That'll make it work. Yeah. Yeah, my garden is overrun with peppers. I've got, uh, I've got, this must have been a good year for peppers because I've got them all, all kinds coming left and right. Um, well, good enough, uh, guys. And, uh, as far as what's in the hopper here in my place, I've got a dry traditional mead with wildflower going. I went a different direction with the yeast. I uh, I used the Smack Pack Y yeast uh, 4632. Started out at uh, 1122. Going to take it all the way dry. Uh, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a wine-like dry uh, white mead. Uh, end result. That's what I like to drink, and, and that's what I'm hoping for. Uh, as far as uh, things, uh, I mean, I've got various projects, including the coffee. Actually, several coffees going um, I've got the sour wood that I'm act, I'm just overjoyed uh, that you know after taking my verbal abuse and and just ignoring it, letting it pout over there in a the corner all by itself, it's finally reached its potential. I think so. Uh, I just need to get it clear now. I know that, that I might have some trouble with that. I might have to put some some clearing agents in to uh, to get it to do that, but. JD, when when that thing finally did go, uh, did it did it turn out with a lot of hot fusel alcohols, or is it pretty no. smooth? No, it's very smooth. It, in fact, it has a a chardonnay like quality to it. Uh, it. Reminds me very much of an unoaked uh, chardonnay that's just a tad on the sweet side. Uh, so I'm very pleased with that flavor. I, I really like that flavor. Uh, and if I could do it again, and but you know, not have the hiccup that I had, I don't know if this was the expected outcome, or is this a result of the you know three different yeasts that went into actually four, I think maybe four different yeasts that went into this thing. No, three different yeasts that went into this thing. I have no idea. But uh, I'm very pleased with the outcome, the way it stands right now. Uh, I couldn't be happier. So, yeah. um, you know. Don't you start with like, good meat? Well, you know, uh, I want to try it again. And, uh, you know, I may, uh, may do some horse trading and send you some more wildflower and, uh, and do this thing again. Uh, only uh, sure. do a five-gallon batch. But I'm just a little leery. Uh, right now, a little bit skittish. I know, uh, you know, once you get off that horse, get back on it, and, you know, uh, because your ride ain't done yet. But uh, I just got to kind of review everything that I did. And, uh, you know, but absolutely, it's something that I want to do it again. Now, as far as what's on my wish list, um, Aaron, you and I got to hook up because I just bottled my first beer uh, yesterday. Uh, and I'm looking forward. Now, this is a pumpkin beer that I did. Uh, my first, my first, I, I, I'm hoping this is going to come out well because I want to make some for Thanksgiving. But um interested in combining the whole hop malt stuff with honey and carbonating a mead uh, like that, like, like a beer. Okay, so... Uh, 